my whole family uh, introduced me to music. It's been, music's been a part of my life as far back as I can remember. That I grew up in the Delta. My family uh, members were like porch pickers, I guess. They never did it professionally. But um, man, they just introduced me to music and nothing makes me feel the way that music does. I still love it as much now as when I very first started playing. And I guess I was uh, around 15 or 16 when I kind of got brave enough to ask them to start showing me some chords and stuff. Um, and they did all kinds of music. They did gospel, R&B, um, country, and my uncle and aunts are, were closer to my age. They were about 10 years older than me. And my aunt is the one I think that corrupted me into rock. She got Kiss Destroyer. And she came in and played the record for me, man. And she turned on, like, shouted out loud, God of Thunder, and I just freaked out, man. I, I remember hearing the little voices on God of Thunder, and it scared me. I, like, ran out of the room. I was probably six years old, and I ran back in. I was like, I gotta hear that again. What was that, man? And uh, so I fell in love with Kiss right away. They were kind of like the, the my introduction into rock. And uh, that Kiss Alive record, man, I wore that thing out. It was awesome. But um, I kind of started out um, in Memphis. I had moved there uh, in the early 80s, and I bumped into uh, Patrick and Keith and John, I, um, probably around 86, 87, I think is when that happened. And uh, Keith and John and Patrick had actually uh, played in a band together, or they were starting to play. And Keith and John had had a band uh, called Lycanthrope after the Werewolf. They were doing a dual guitar thing. It was kind of like Iron Maiden, Judas Priest kind of thing. And uh, so when I met them, I had never seen. I had kind of a little neighborhood band I was singing in, and I felt like they were much more uh, advanced, you know, and they had done recordings and stuff like that. So I was freaking out when I met them. But um, we just met, and when we first started playing, we were doing like some Cheap Trick, ZZ Top, Aerosmith, uh, some Zeppelin, and Bad Company. And we learned a few covers and then we kind of started thinking that we were butchering them that we weren't doing that great uh, covering them and so we started writing our own stuff and we got interested in that so we started playing some original stuff and uh, at the time the scene in Memphis was amazing it was awesome it had local radio support uh, for for bands there was a guy named Malcolm Riker that was on Rock 98 back in the day he had a locals only show that he would do on Friday nights so all the local bands were trying to get in the studio and record and get your song on the radio so you could get people out to your shows and uh, I think it was kind of a spillover from uh, the Sunset Strip the rock bands that were going on out there we were based out of Memphis our whole life we our whole career we'd stay based out of there but back in the day we were kind of feeling that and um, there was a lot of uh, activity there was a, a lot of shows that Malcolm Riker would do the uh, um, show on Tuesday nights it was a jam you could do uh, 15 minutes or three songs and you know they pulled the plug after like 15 minutes because people would drive from all over the place Arkansas Mississippi you know up in Tennessee they would come they knew about the jam so the building was always packed uh, there was a guy named Mike Glenn that was running the New Daisy on Bill Street back then um, that was really funny um, he he was a boxing promoter that had come to Memphis. He had like uh, 12 fighters he was representing and he came in and did a show uh, in, in the Daisy and they had like a you know smoke and the light one light over the ring and it was people that were professional fighters that were fighting with these people from uh, <laughs> our community that didn't know how to fight. They'd come out and like not have themselves covered up. They'd walk out and get punched in the stomach and fall over. It was it was really funny but as little kids sneaking in there we saw the room and everything and Mike was putting these shows on and uh, he kind of gave us a start of like opening up for some bands and stuff like that back in the day. And uh, we also took initiative as as uh, little entrepreneurs, I guess, in hindsight, is Memphis had that Tuesday night thing and the Daisy to do all ages shows, but there weren't a lot of other places to go and see live music besides that one venue. So we started throwing our own parties. We had a warehouse. Keith's dad was uh, in the glue business and he used to store these like 55 gallon drums in this warehouse space and so what we did is we pushed all the barrels to one end of the room we put some plywood over it and hung black trash bags over the cans and we threw a PA up we put carpet on the wall and black garbage bags all over the warehouse and we created our own little club and so what we would do is we would hire um, football players from Ole Miss they ran the door we'd give them all the beer they could drink and if anybody got crazy they would grab them and throw them out in the parking lot it was a um, it was kind of a uh, uh, a building full of warehouse spaces and we were kind of right in the center 
and so it was off the beaten track, but it was kind of off of uh, next to the Mid South Coliseum. So what we would do is we tried to time our parties when there was a concert at the Coliseum, and we'd have the overflow traffic in our parking lot, and we would let people know we were throwing this party and start, you know, have our music going and all that. And uh, and it kind of got um, built our name up, man. The the guy Malcolm Riker that was on the radio, he would actually plug us on the radio and say, "Don't forget tonight at the warehouse." I mean, it was so cool. We'd be driving around, we were little kids, you know, and the guy was promoting our show. And uh, but it's also where we showcased for the record labels. We uh, we won some studio time. We'd entered some band competitions, and we won time at, at Ardent Studios. And uh, going in there. It, it like changed our life, man. We were working on a little EP, a little cassette that we were working on. And we started at a place called Powerhouse Studios in, in Memphis, Tennessee. It was a guy named Steve uh, Howth, was the engineer. And we had started working on the EP, and so we one time at Ardent, and we kind of transferred going in there to finish the EP. And uh, Paul Ebersole was a guy, the engineer at Ardent, that heard us. And for some reason, he took a liking to us. He just said, hey man, I, I really think I could make you guys sound great. I think I could help you. And so he talked to the people at Ardent and, uh, and asked if we wanted to sign a production deal with them. So that meant that they would cut four sides on us and then shop us to the record labels, which was amazing at the time. And uh, for anybody that's watching this, if you don't know about Ardent Studios, you need to look it up. It's a guy named John Fry that started it. He started in his my, uh, grandmother's sewing room when he was 14, and it's about a 60-year-old studio now that's in Memphis. Everybody in the world, from Zeppelin to freaking Stevie Ray Vaughan, Almond Brothers, Leonard Skinner, everybody's come here to, to record there. It was amazing. And uh, John was kind of like a, a father figure to our band. He took us in a little room, like a little conference room, and put a circle on the wall, and he put one little line in it, and he said, this is you, and this is everybody else that's going to be digging in your pocket. You know, he tried to talk to us about the music business. And of course, we just went, where do we sign up? We don't care. I mean, we want to go play music, you know? And uh, so he helped us. They were actually kind of a buffer between us and the, the major record labels. But they they cut the demos on us, and they ended up uh, shopping us to record labels, and they came to that warehouse. They would come in the room. We uh, There was some office space in the front of the warehouse, and we built a bar on top of the offices and made like a little VIP area for the record label people. And so they just came in early and they stood there and they watched organically as the crowd came in and it was kids like dragging coolers in their lawn chairs and smoking. I mean, we had cans out everywhere for people to smoke and all that stuff. And they just saw that we had kind of built a little community. And it was because of our friends from high school, man. Uh, Keith and John went to one high school and Patrick and I went to another school. So automatically, right when we first got together, we had like a little built-in core group of people that would come out and get rowdy for us. And it was amazing. They, it was because of them that we got on the radio and we won the Battle of the Bands. They came out and you know would yell for us and, all, and vote and all that stuff. And once we let a record out, they were calling MTV and getting our songs voted up on the countdowns and all that stuff. I mean, it, it was it was organic and authentic, the thing that happened with us, which was pretty cool. And we just took what happened in Memphis and tried to spread it everywhere that we went. That was kind of our mission is we, when we, when we had the name Torah Tour when it started, we got it off of Women and Children uh, first, the Van Halen record. And we had tried a couple of other names or was throwing names out, but there, we had a friend in high school, uh, a girl named Kelly Coffee, that had a list of names and she had Torah Tour on there. And we were like, man, that sounds kind of cool. It's the Van Halen thing. We love Van Halen, you know. But the thing that got us was we played that, uh, the New Daisy place, that room, and the crowd showed up and they got this chant going, Torah, Torah, Torah. It was kind of like the toga chant out of Animal House. They were all in there, kind of rowdy. And we said, hey, the man, that feels like it might stick. We might hang on to this for a minute. It feels like people are liking it. And so that kind of got us started on that part. And um, But anyway, we worked with Ardent. We showcased at the warehouse. And there was a guy named Brian Huttenhauer who was working for A&M Records. And that when we did those showcases, we did a couple of them. Um, we always would, after those parties, would have to go out and clear the parking lot from pizza boxes and beer bottles and all that kind of stuff. And we had to do it before five in the morning when the big 18 wheelers started rolling in for the other warehouses. So after our parties, we would jump in a pickup truck and put one of those big 50 gallon drums in the back and go throw all the garbage in it. Well, Brian Huttenhauer stayed. He rode around in the back of the pickup with us and was talking to us. And we just thought he was the most awesome dude in the world. We just, we went to the studio, we went to John Fry and then we said, hey man, we really think this guy is the most genuinely excited person about the band. We want to like talk to them. 
and I mean A and M, the history of it. I mean they had everybody from humble pie to I mean you name all the rock bands that was on their sticks and everybody. I mean we were just out of our mind. We couldn't believe we were going to get on there. And uh, it was really funny. Keith and I were like cutting grass for a living. We were little kids. My mom was a real estate agent, and we were like going around cutting all our properties, you know, trying to make a buck. And we, I remember riding around and we would say, man, could you imagine if we got to get in the studio and record? You know, that was the, one of the first missions. And then we got to do that. And then we said, man, wouldn't it be crazy if we got to meet a record label? And, you know, got to talk to them. You know, all these what if things that we were kind of big sky dreaming. And the next thing we knew, A&M was at the table with us. And they were like, we want to do a record. We want to do a full project. And it just, I don't know, it changed our whole direction of our life. It was it was Paul Ebersole for sure meeting him, and then John Fry, who he remained one of my closest friends, ever since I was 16 years old. Every decision I ever made in my life about the music industry, I talked to him. He passed away about four years ago, and I miss him like crazy. He was kind of like a you know a springboard I could call him in whatever area I was in my life about record labels or publishing or whatever it was. I could always talk to him about it. On Surprise Attack. Um, the whole experience was crazy. Everything from doing the recordings. We worked with Paul Ebersole, and he also brought in a guy uh, named Joe Hardy, who actually gave us a lot of credibility. He had done uh, all the ZZ Top records were kind of just hitting huge. The Eliminators, you know, you got Lex and Give Me All Your Love and all that. I mean, he had worked on all that stuff. And so for him to kind of sign on to co-produce with Paul was a big deal because it gave us credibility within the industry. It was, it was amazing. And so, um, the whole first record we were trying to figure out what we were doing. It was such a cool experience and being in there and being creative and working with those guys. And we really owe them a, a, a debt of gratitude for how they made us sound, man. I still love those records. I mean, I'm super biased because we're in, you know, in, the, in the band, but the quality of the work that Joe did, um, we just actually lost Joe Hardy about two weeks ago from the time we're doing this interview. But that first record, man, I mean, it was it it changed our life, man. That going on the road, that having exposure on MTV and all that, and it was a, a lot of it was attributed to them spending time with us and doing pre-production and working on the the individual parts. And then uh, I was talking about our management company, Too Loud and Proud. They had hooked us up with some between them and A and M, great photographers, Mark Weiss did the album cover and captured us down on the river, which was awesome. We were, it was our first big photo shoot, man. We were super stoked about it. We were freaking out. And uh, the fact that we were gonna have a record, like an album and a cassette and a CD, you know, like coming out was just mind boggling to us. We were just freaking out about it. But um, it was just a cool experience. The whole first record, uh, the first tour, we went out, we, we went on tour with um, Dangerous Toys, LA Guns, Bonham, the Cold. We played all kind of festivals with all of the people that we were fans of. It was crazy. And once we went on the road, we didn't want to go home. We get, like got the taste of it. We were like, oh my God, this is the most amazing experience. And getting to get up in front of people every night and play your songs was, man, that was like your dream, man, to get up and the people are singing the words back to you. I mean, you're like, you get a, a rush from that, man, it's crazy. Um, so it was a crazy experience. But um, Brian Huttenhauer at A&M, John Fry at Ardent, Richard Sanders, who was part of the Loud and Proud team, um, all of those guys had a huge impact on us early on, just kind of guiding us, talking to us about the industry. We weren't as engaged in the business side. We were wanting to be creative. We trusted those people to make good decisions with us. But it was a, it was a wild experience. And to be young, I mean, I think when we went on the road, I wasn't even old enough to get into bars. I could go in and do sound check, and they would tell me I'd have to go wait outside. You know, Keith and the other guys are a couple years older than me, and. Um, um, but it was, it was just to be where we are now, like 30 years down the road, and to be recording music together. And it's, I mean, friends that we've known forever, we're still telling the same stupid jokes, you know, to each other that we're still getting cracked up about. But um, it's real family to us, and and that's how we feel about all the people that listen to us and then come out and sing the songs with us, our fans, and we consider them our family, man. They're they're like our little community that we built out of Memphis, and. Uh, it runs deep with us. Like Patrick and Keith, the bass player and the guitar player, have known each other since they were eight years old. I mean, they've known them almost their whole life. They've been friends. So we've been through a lot of crazy experiences, man. Everything from starting out little and not knowing our head from the hole in the ground to getting exposure and having a major label behind us and having money backing us and all that to the record deal going away, which was total chaos you know chaotic for us it kind of the brakes went on for a minute so 
it's it's been a roller coaster, but we went through all those things together, and to have stayed friends through everything, it's been amazing. Like we never really had one of those big blow up. You know, we're gonna not hang out with each other or whatever. We were always still close. We just kind of all went off to do, you know, different creative things and raise families and. You know, we our perspectives just changed a little bit, but the passion for music and man, the rock community and everything has never gone away. We love it.